Welcome everybody for our weekly seminar series. Um, today, we're hosting Dr. Egal Bernstein from the Department of Marine Biology in our own university. So Dr. Bernstein is a quantitative marine ecologist and a biophysical oceanographer studying complex interactions in the ocean. He addresses fundamental scientific and environmental questions concerning the marine environment by combining oceanography, data science, numerical modeling, and sensory ecology. Dr. Bernstein completed his first postdoctoral position at the Rosenthal School of Marine, Atmospheric, and Earth Science, the University of Miami. During this time, Dr. Bernstein led uh, innovative uh, research, which revealed that the Gulf of Mexico, Deepwater Horizon, oil spill, was substantially larger than previously thought and consisted of vast toxic regions that were previously not considered to be contaminated. During his second and postdoctoral uh, position at the Cooperative Institute, Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Studies at the University of Miami, Dr. Bernstein led uh, the development and calibration of an ecosystem model of the uh, Gulf of Mexico oil spill, examining the ex effect of forage fish harvest on their pred predators. In this research, he focused on the contribution of early life stages of fish to large scale ecological processes, as these stages often drive population dynamics while at the same time representing one of the greatest knowledge gaps in marine ecology. So today we are very honored to uh, host uh, Dr. Bernstein, who is going to talk about the effect of uh, oil pollution on the marine environment and the coastal population, a quantitative and interdisciplinary approach. So Igal, the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicholas, for inviting me and uh, for presenting me. Um, okay, now we need to hope that we won't get the blue screen again. Last time it happened when I uh, put the presenter mode. Okay, I think every, everything is okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we see. Yeah. Okay, and you hear me well, right? Okay, so... Um, so uh, I, I will tell you today about the effect of oil spill on the marine environment and coastal uh, population, uh, uh, quantitative uh, interdisciplinary approach. And first of all, I want, I, I want to say that I'm happy uh, to be, you know, presenting uh, to, to this department because, you know, we're uh, at the same school and I think there's uh, plenty of room for collaboration and it's good that uh, you know uh, me as a new scientist and my work. And so this is uh, basically um, one component of uh, my work. So uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I did my PhD in Ben Gurion University and in Eilat at the Inter-University Institute. And I worked mainly on uh, larval dispersal and connectivity and the behavior, orientation behavior of uh, larval fish. And uh, then I went on to do my first postdoc working on uh, marine pollution. And what I will present today was uh, mainly done during my first postdoc position. Uh, I then moved on uh, in my second postdoc to work on ecosystem modeling. And now uh, I started the position um, here at the University of, Ma uh, University of Haifa uh, in the Department of Marine Biology. Um, so, um, my other fields of expertise are, uh, as I said, dispersal and connectivity, and basically how larva fish find their way and what are the implications in terms of marine protected areas. And uh, um, also, on, I work on ecosystem modeling and uh, how climate change uh, may affect uh, the trophic dynamics in, in marine ecosystem. Um, but today I will mainly focus on uh, marine pollution. Um, and first I want to uh, acknowledge uh, my collaborators for this uh, work. And uh, the, this uh, work 
was mainly done as part of uh, uh, the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. Um, and we were a part of a, a big consortium led by, by uh, Steve Morawski, um, which is called C Image 3. And that consortium, the, the idea was that uh, 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 it was a big effort to model as much as possible uh, the dynamics of oil spills, uh, but in all aspects, both uh, the spatial, spatial temporal dynamics of the spill itself, and then how it affects the uh, marine ecosystem and how it affects the humans and etc. So it was a very interdisciplinary um, consortium and, and this work was mainly uh, done as part of, uh, of this uh, consortium. And uh, these are uh, my main uh, collaborators and this was done uh, also in, uh, with uh, Claire Paris, who was my uh, first uh, postdoc advisor. And as you see, uh, plenty of uh, institutes in uh, around the Gulf of Mexico and California and, and uh, Florida, et cetera. Um, and, and so as I begin, uh, every aspect of my work begins with this. So it's, it's the fundamental motivation for, for uh, our work. And, and it is basically the fact that we are as a humanity completely dependent on the marine ecosystem for our survival and our livelihood. It provides us uh, climate regulation, oxygen, uh, drinking water, uh, food, uh, tourism, and at the same time, it is under a lot of uh, stress and under a lot of, uh, um, there's a lot of threats uh, that are um, acting on this uh, precious ecosystem uh, um, uh, all the time. And these uh, include overfishing, uh, pollution, and climate change. And we got a, a good reminder last year when we had the oil spill, uh, the, the tar uh, pollution in our coasts um, in February 2021. And I will also um, speak about that a little bit as well. Um, so um, the overview of this talk, I will first talk about the deep, my work on the deep water horizon and how we discovered the invisible and toxic um, oil, and uh, then I will talk about uh, the effects of fishery closures on uh, fishery dependent communities as a result of um, potential oil spills. Uh, I will then move on uh, and show how we can compare different scenarios of oil spills. And I will speak a little bit about the oil spill we had last year, and I will uh, summarize um, so my first uh, part, uh, just as I started um, uh, my uh, postdoc, I started to work on the Deepwater Horizon, which was the largest marine uh, oil spill uh, in history. Over 200 million gallons uh, lasted for uh, more than 87 days. It covered more than a third of the uh, US uh, EEZ. Um, the oil slicks covered more than a third of the uh, US EEZ. 11 people were killed. It was a major, major disaster. And um, basically my first uh, question when I started to work on this oil spill was, what was the special extent of this spill? And when I asked this question, I kept getting the same answer. Uh, which is the uh, oil slick uh, cumulative uh, uh, footprint. And that was the answer given in uh, scientific publications, in, um, uh, uh, in governmental report, in the media. And then my next question was whether the satellite footprint truly accounts for the entire oil spill. And um, to ask this question, I looked at three main sources of information. Um, I looked at uh, in situ uh, water and sediment samples, more than 60,000 samples. 
um, I, I did a, a literature review of published studies related to the Deepwater Horizon with field measurements. Um, and I uh, used the oil transport model developed in uh, Claire Clarice's lab. And basically, um, what, we, what you see on the left side is the uh, cumulative satellite footprint in red. The dotted um, yellow line is the cumulative fisheries closure, closures. And fr from this picture, it seems that the uh, fisheries closure encompass the uh, deepwater horizon spill. But what you see on the right hand side is the, uh, the, the, co uh, the color map represents the oil transport uh, model results. Um, the uh, the uh, red uh, uh, dots represent in situ samples with concentrations, oil concentrations higher than background, indicating a presence of oil. And the crosses, the red crosses, represent uh, independent uh, published studies that indicate the presence of oil in these specific areas. And as you can see, these two different maps are very different. And the right map clearly indicates that the Deepwater Horizon oil spill was uh, significantly larger than what was captured um, by the satellite footprint. Um, okay, but then my next question was whether, whether this is important because if that extra uh, extended portion is not toxic to marine life, then we shouldn't care, right? So uh, that was my next question, whether the extended portion and that the satellite did not capture was that uh, toxic. And to, uh, to answer these questions, I looked at, uh, at the uh, satellite footprint area on the top uh, graph. And on the bottom graph, you can see the in situ uh, PAH measurements. PAH is the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, which represents the toxic portion of the oil. And so um, what we can see in the, in the blue vertical line is the time where, where they managed to uh, stop the spill. That was the 12th of July, uh, 2010. So that was 87 days after the spill started. It started at uh, April 20, 2010. And so, from that point in time, you can see that the spill stopped. And then there is a decay of the satellite footprint. It took about 22 days until no uh, satellite uh, um, signal for the oil was identified. But in the meantime, as you can see with the in situ measurements, there is still uh, oil in the water and it is toxic. You can see that it is above the toxicity threshold, which was determined uh, by the government. Okay, so even though the satellite uh, did not uh, identify that, uh, that uh, uh, the signal, there is still toxic oil in the water. And so I used these two thresholds. Okay, so. Uh, then I, from the time that the satellite did not identify uh, the, the uh, oil signal, from that time I took the maximum, the average of the maximum uh, five samples concentration, and I uh, I treated this uh, uh, concentration as the visibility threshold, meaning that below this concentration at the top layer of the, of the water, the satellite can no longer identify the, the spill. And so using these two uh, thresholds, the visibility threshold 
and the toxicity threshold, I managed to create three meaningful portions for the spill. The visible and toxic portion, the invisible and toxic portion, and the invisible and non-toxic portion. And when I plug these three, uh, these three portions to our model, we got uh, this map. So the, the brown, the, the dark brown represents the uh, visible and toxic, the yellow represents invisible and toxic, and the blue represents a non-toxic. And as you can see, the, the invisible and toxic portion um, extend beyond, uh, beyond the fisheries closure and beyond the satellite footprint and reach, uh, cover vast areas of the Gulf of Mexico. And that was not considered uh, before this work. And we can see that it is toxic. This invisible uh, portion is toxic to uh, many organisms, including uh, sea trout and uh, red drum, mahi mahi, fiddler crab, etc. And these were only the, the organisms that were tested. Of you know, it it is uh, uh, we can assume that it is toxic to many other uh, organisms. So uh, what interesting is that what uh, causes this uh, high uh, toxicity is what we call the uh, photo-induced toxicity, which is the combined effect of oil toxicity or pH toxicity with UV radiation. And in fact, this combined effect can be a uh, hundred times more toxic than the toxicity of uh, oil alone. And uh, importantly, the most vulnerable uh, life stages for this effect are the early life stages, larval fish and uh, larval invertebrates. Um, so in addition, we, uh, in addition to looking at the uh, cumulative extent, we, uh, we managed to uh, cut a few days, uh, a few um, cuts in the uh, duration of the spill. And, um, and that also um, uh, demonstrates good correspondence. So what we can see at the top is the satellite footprint. Uh, in the middle, um, middle panels are the, um, um, oil spill, oil, oil uh, uh, spill model uh, uh, results, the concentrations, and at the bottom uh, panel we can see again the visible and toxic, and visible and toxic and non uh, toxic, and what we can see is that the shape of the visible and toxic uh, portions resemble in shape and size to uh, the obtained uh, satellite footprint from the actual satellites. And this can be, can be useful for, uh, for uh, oil spill uh, analysis, uh, future oil spill analysis um, uh, uses. So this, this was published in the Science Advance and um, it made quite a big splash uh, in, the scientific, in the scientific community as well as in, in, uh, in the media, because uh, first of all, it showed that the Deepwater Horizon was a larger, uh, significantly larger than it was uh, previously assumed. And it had a lot of uh, implications uh, because people uh, got injured, all, all sorts of, uh, uh, cleaning uh, response teams that worked in Florida, for example, they, they, some of them got sick, but uh, the, the oil company told them that the, the spill didn't get to there, so they don't have a basis for their claims. So uh, uh, this work, I hope it, it helped them to, uh, to get the proper compensation. And, and uh, all sorts of legal teams were in touch with our team um, and hopefully 
uh, it was uh, successful, but it also kind of changed the way uh, the way uh, people uh, conceive uh, oil spill in general because it shows that the oil can be toxic even if it is not uh, captured by satellites or by the eye, uh, and it is beyond both in both in uh, space and in time it lasts beyond what the eye can capture. Um, but beyond the, the direct effect of, of the, the oil spill on the, the marine environment, the, you know, the, the, the animals that die because of the oil spill, there are all, also other effects on the human population. And the next uh, project that uh, I will present is uh, our um, attempt to, to examine how uh, potential oil spills can affect fishery uh, dependent communities. And specifically, we'll focus on the fact that when an oil spill occurs, vast areas of, of the sea are closed for fishing because, uh, because there's a, a, a desire to protect both the population that consumes fish and also the fishers. But with these closures, the fisher, the fishers lose quite a lot of, of their uh, income. And so this, uh, this project was done to try and assess uh, and uh, quantify uh, the potential effect of, of such closures. And uh, we know from, from the Deepwater Horizon that the, the uh, loss, losses uh, in terms of revenue and wages are, are in, the, in the millions and sometimes in the billions of dollars. Um, many, many, many people uh, lost a lot of uh, money and employment and livelihood. Um, and, and much of that, about 20%, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, was due to the closures. Um, but not all people are affected equally by, by these closures. Because if uh, we're talking about a wealthy community that has uh, a lot of uh, income sources, then the effect will be uh, limited. However, some communities, they're in a low uh, socioeconomical uh, status and they, they are more dependent on fishing for their uh, livelihood. And uh, in addition, uh, they might be poorer. And, and so uh, to assess this uh, effect, uh, we used what uh, we call the social vulnerability indices, which uh, considers um, more than 20 different parameters, such as socioeconomic status, the uh, commercial and industrial development, the family structures, etc. And basically it gives a score to the level of uh, the social vulnerability of the community. And we try to uh, create a quantitative framework to better understand uh, the effect of oil spill and specifically closures on uh, fishery dependent communities in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. And we used um, three uh, sources of uh, information, the uh, three the uh, oil spill modeling, uh, commercial fishing analysis, and the social vulnerability index. And together, it allowed us to assess the impact on the fish, uh, fishing communities. Specifically, um, we used the fisheries observer and uh, locations data. And using a random forest classifier, together with the fishing ve vessel movement data, we could we could uh, determine uh, when the vessels were fishing using the VMS data. And based on that, we, we could map the fishing locations. And these fishing locations are associated to each county in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. So we knew from which county the fishers uh, went out. And um, I will later show how we calculated the impact, uh, the, the uh, revenue lost based on the county. So the other source of information was the spill data. So these are 
put um, uh, theoretical spills, they didn't occur, but they are uh, similar in uh, size and duration to the, Gulf, uh, to the deep water horizon. And so based on the uh, toxic areas of, uh, of uh, based on the toxic concentration of the spill, we applied automatic fishery closures. And from these fishery closures, from these polygons, together with the mapped fishing locations, we could uh, uh, compute the lost fishing locations. Then using fisheries logbook data, which uh, records the, uh, the, the economics, how, how much um, the fishes are sold for, etc. We could uh, co compute the lost revenue by county, and then integrating the social vulnerability index, we could, we could compute the impact on the community given uh, this given its social vulnerability index. Um, so, so this uh, work was uh, published in ICS, and on the right you can see this uh, one of the potential uh, spills and the and the automatic fishery closures that encompass the toxic concentrations of this uh, theoretical spill, and on the right the plots you can see uh, here um, four types of uh, colors for the counties. So uh, you have the blue color for the county, which represents um, a county that lost a little bit of revenue, and it has a low social vulnerability score, which means that it is not vulnerable in terms of uh, socioeconomics. And on the, on the contrary, you have the red uh, color, which represents both uh, vulnerable communities and the fact that they lost uh, a lot of uh, revenue. And you have the middle uh, situations where you have vulnerable communities that, uh, has, that encounter uh, low losses and, um, <clears throat> and uh, invulnerable communities that encounter great losses. So that was basically the, uh, this project. Um, and the bottom line uh, was that we can uh, create a framework that can predict which counties are going to suffer the greatest loss given their social vulnerability uh, situation. And this can allow managers to, to pre better prepare for such situations. Um, and the third uh, project that I'm going to present is, is based on the fact that deep sea oil spills are very complex events. They occur uh, in 3D, uh, some of the oil sinks to the sediment, some of the oil is uh, in the water column, there, there's uh, in the deep water horizon, there was a deep intrusion in the depth of about 120, uh, 1,200 meters. Um, uh, much of the oil uh, gets to the beach. And in any, uh, in any such event, wherever the oil goes, it uh, kills and harms uh, the, the marine environment. And so it's pretty hard to, to compare uh, different scenarios because you have a different uh, extent on the beach and a different uh, three, three dimensional volume uh, expansion, et cetera. So this project was done in attempt to kind of make an order and be able to compare different scenarios of uh, oil spills. And we used, uh, again, the, the oil transport model developed in the Paris lab. Um, we used for this uh, analysis, the Atlantis ecosystem model, which is a end-to-end -end, uh, trophodynamic ecosystem model, uh, which includes uh, uh, various uh, trophic levels uh, for the Gulf of Mexico. And um, synthesizing these two sources of information and uh, applying a simple post-processing 
we could effectively compare or create a, a, a quantitative framework for comparison between uh, spill scenarios. So we used a, a, a wide range of uh, variables, um, the total volume of the spill, the toxic volume of the spill, the total area of the spill, the toxic area of the spill, the sedimented mass, the beached mass, the length of the beached coastline. Um, and in terms of ecosystem model, we looked at the minimum biomass following the spill and uh, the years uh, and, until the ecosystem recovers and, and etc. And um, so we, we use four different scenarios uh, for, the, for this analysis. One is the actual deep water horizon, the hindcast of the deep water horizon. The second scenario is the exact uh, parameters of the deep water horizon, but occurring during the fall instead of uh, uh, the spring. Um, additional scenario was a spill occurring in the East Gulf of Mexico, where uh, there is actual uh, searches or attempts to drill. And the, the fourth one was in the West Gulf of Mexico. And you can see that on one hand side, on, on, on one hand, uh, the, there is a difference between the scenarios, and that is the, the cumulative, the, the upper plots are the cumulative uh, uh, oil concentrations uh, of each spill. And on, on the bottom uh, plots is the uh, sedimented mass that sank to the sediment. And you can see that. On one hand, there is a difference. On the other hand, they are comparable, at least in terms of size and extent, but they vary in the, in the location. But if we look at, at, in terms of the evolution in time, <coughs> so, so the, blue, the blue line represents the control, the red represents the fall, the gold represents the eastern Gulf of Mexico spill, and the um, purple represents the west Gulf of Mex Mexico spill. And here also you can see that there is no uh, a single scenario that is the worst or the best. For each, uh, for each variable, there is sometimes, uh, for example, here, the, uh, the, the original deep water horizon is the worst. But on the other hand, uh, in terms of uh, impacted area, uh, the Eastern Gulf of Mexico spill is, uh, is worse. And so we don't have like a single scenario that in all cases is the worst scenario. And this is similar in terms of the impacted volume and the uh, volume impacted with toxic uh, concentrations. And so we can uh, combine all this information into very simple uh, statistics. And these statistics, they, they rank uh, for each variable, they rank which one was the worst, which is uh, number four in the red color, and, uh, for, and which one had the least impact, which is green and uh, with uh, the number one. And so we ranked for, uh, for each variable, for all the, the scenarios. And what we can find is that all in all, it seems that the Eastern Gulf of Mexico uh, scenario was the worst, but it's not, it is not conclusive because sometimes it was the worst, sometimes it wasn't the worst. And there's, uh, it is a comparable uh, um, situation. Um, the other thing we can do is look at a correlation between uh, the different uh, variables in terms of the ranks. And what we can see, for example, is that there is a correlation uh, between uh, the, the um, ecosystem parameters, which makes sense. So uh, wherever you have uh, the minimum uh, uh, biomass uh, loss, then the biomass change is also minimal. That makes sense. But also, 
you have um, a negative correlation between the beached mass and the oiled volume. So how, how can that be? Well, when you have a lot of oil on the beach, it means that you have less oil in the water column. And that is also important for um, decision making for decision makers because there are all sorts of means to reduce the oil in the surface, for example, using uh, chemical dispersant, which are chemicals that if you put it on the oil slicks, the oil uh, is more dissolved in the water column. But then the question is, well, what do you prefer to harm? the animals that are in the water column or the animals that are on the coast. And that is a, a complex question that uh, nobody has the answer yet. Um, and so the, this was published in a, in, as a chapter in, in a book called Scenarios and Responses to Future uh, Deep Oil Spills. And this is uh, the, the four different scenarios that um, I told you about. Um, and similarly, using the same technique we developed for uh, this uh, chapter, we simulated oil spills beyond the Gulf of Mexico. One was in uh, Cuba and the other was in West Africa. And I think the most striking uh, thing that you can see in this plot is that the, the extent of this oil spill is huge. It uh, covers, I don't know, a, a half of, or a, the, like a, a big country in Africa. It's, it's a huge extent. And you can only imagine the impact that it has on the marine ecosystem. And because we usually don't see it and it's hard to quantify, so we don't talk about it and we don't think about it. But these type of events, are, are uh, really ha have a tremendous impact on the marine ecosystem. Um, and uh, we, we got a good reminder last year with, with uh, a tar pollution event that we weren't uh, prepared for. And uh, using um, as part of, of another uh, project that I, I am leading and it's coming to an end, uh, in which we quantify the connectivity, the larval connectivity in the Eastern Mediterranean between the marine protected areas. So we, we had already the uh, data for the currents and uh, we used that uh, platform, that data to simulate the, the spill that occurred, uh, the, the pollution that occurred in Israel um, uh, last year. And um, we, we identified the oil slick that also was also identified by, by uh, Israeli EPA and also other, um, other centers. And we uh, modeled forward in time the evolution of uh, the spill. And here you can see the uh, uh, cumulative oil concentrations. And you can see that the, the impact on the Israeli shore is similar to what was observed in the field. It, it covered the entire uh, Israeli coast and especially in the northern area uh, closer to Haifa. And you can obviously see that it overlaps with the marine protected areas denoted here in red. And uh, and uh, you can also see the, the uh, cumulative uh, sedimented oil on the coast, which also uh, resembles uh, what was observed in the field. Um, and, and we are now uh, working on trying to understand the impact on the uh, different organisms, uh, different uh, on the marine ecosystem. And this is a work in progress that hopefully will be out uh, soon. Um, so uh, to summarize in this work, um, uh, so, so as, as I explained, the, the Sea Image Consortium uh, tried to kind of 
connect uh, and model all the aspects of uh, the impacts of oil spill. And in, in our work, we uh, kind of covered uh, some of these aspects. So in terms of the, uh, from the oil release, how it transports in the water and uh, the uh, toxic areas that are uh, uh, transported and, and distributed in the ecosystem. And from there, we, we were able to compute um, the effect both on the ecosystem in terms of uh, trophic level and as well as the uh, fisheries and the oil shoreline. And from these, we expanded and we were able to uh, quantify the effect of the closures on, uh, on the economics and even the uh, socioeconomics of the uh, population. And uh, hopefully, uh, so this is a kind of a conceptual diagram, but uh, the, the, the general idea is to be able to quantitatively link these different aspects to hopefully one day create a kind of a mega model that can predict and and quantify uh, the different effects of oil spills on these uh, different um, disciplines. And a little bit on, on uh, the Israeli coast, the Mediterranean coast. So of course, we, we all know that we have the oil, the, the gas platforms, which you know, similar, can be similarly uh, uh, polluting, polluting and dangerous. Uh, and beyond these gas platforms, we have uh, terrestrial runoff, which is also a, 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 another a severe type of uh, pollutant. Uh, in, in our case, we can also, uh, it can happen that we will have a catastrophe similar to what, was, to what happened um, in the Gulf of Mexico. It happened in, in the Mediterranean already in other places. Um, and uh, we need to be prepared uh, as much as we can. And we got a good reminder for what can happen. And even for this uh, spill that occurred last year, we, can, we, we actually didn't get any assessment of the impact of the spill on the marine environment because it's complicated to do, and that's, that's what hopefully we will do uh, in the following uh, months. Um, and to summarize, if we kind of zoom out uh, on the Mediterranean, so the, as we know, um, oil pollution follows closely the marine shipping traffic. And uh, wherever there's a lot of shipping, there's always uh, oil pollution. And if we look at uh, the connectivity between marine protected areas in the Mediterranean, we see uh, with the oil pollution. And uh, we have to even consider this more when we think about the, about the fact that the most sensitive uh, animals or organisms or life stages are the early, uh, the, the larval fish and larval invertebrates, and they are all over uh, the pelagic realm. So they are all over, uh, all over the area and they are mostly impacted by uh, these spills and we simply don't know, we don't know, uh, it's hard to quantify, but we know that that is the situation. Um, and with this, I would like to uh, thank everyone um, for listening. I would like to acknowledge all the uh, centers and uh, the funding uh, uh, agencies and all my co collaborators. Um, I would like to note that um, I am looking for uh, students. I'm opening a new lab here in the University of Haifa. And I will be happy to get questions. Thank you very much, uh, Adel, for the exciting talk. Really 
I remember when the uh, deep uh, deep water horizon really. Um, I remember it like yesterday. So we do have questions. Um, well, I, I will start with the chat. Uh, Eli Elias Mizrahi is asking, well, he, he didn't ask actually. He just say that also in Brazil in 2019. Ah, yeah, it was uh, oil spill in Brazil. So I don't know exactly what he's mentioning, but if you have a question, Elias, so just. Uh, I, I will just mention, yeah. I will just say something about this. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the, the, the oil spill in Brazil was, um, you know, what happened was that suddenly there was a lot of oil coming into the shore and they, and they didn't know what was the source. And I think that's uh, even, even um, emphasizes the, the need for proper modeling of oil spill because you don't always know the source. So you need to be able to make a back, uh, backward simulation in time. And, and I think that, that was a good example for how the oil can be sometimes invisible and sometimes it appears on the surface and, and we really need to be able to understand it better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there are two questions from Orly and Beverly. Um, I will start with uh, Orly. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I have two questions, if I may. Um, the first one related to the social uh, vulnerability uh, index that you've done. Um, did you do it um, only for the fishermen or for the whole community that fishermen are living in? Um, because it, it, it's a big difference economic wise and mm. to see only the fishermen or the, or the old community around. Right, so, so we did it for the entire county. So that's data that we had on the county level, but there's also, and that we didn't do, but there's also um, even higher resolution on specific communities. And we didn't do that, we did, we did it based on the county level because we had the limitation of the data um, access because it's a very confidential data for the fishermen because they don't want to, other people to know who fishes where and how much they get. So the, the, high, the highest resolution that we, we could get was the county level and, and even that was pretty complicated. So, yeah. I see. And, and the other question is something that you mentioned, mentioned earlier, maybe I misunderstood, but you said that you've looked about climate change related uh, impact. Like if my, my question is, is, is the sea temperature is rising, will it affect the model and the oil spill um, in, in, in future? Um, so, so what I what I mentioned about climate change is part of my other work that I didn't present uh, now, and it is it is uh, you know maybe in, in a different presentation I will we'll talk about it. But but yes, the temperature, uh, the, the water density, it affects uh, it affects the oil spill dynamics because first of all it affects the currents. And it affects the buoyancy uh, because the oil droplets um, they, they, they rise and they coagulate based on the um, among other things on the temperature. So uh, so tem temperature rise, sea level, um, temperature rise, uh, and, and other changes they they will affect the oil spill dynamics, but. I think their other impacts are uh, already larger than that. The specific uh, difference that it will uh, do to uh, oil spills, but that's my guess. I didn't check. Okay. It. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Beverly. Go ahead. Hi, Gal. Welcome to Hi. Haifa. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice to have you join us. Um, <laughs> So I, a question I have, it may not be for you, but you know, it's more for conversation, I guess. But on the, um, on the Israeli maps that you're showing, it's interesting that while there are marine um, 
protected areas, the shipping lanes um, remain, they, they go over the marine protected areas, which is, yeah. I realized that, you know, for oil spills, you know, there's different sources or different possibilities, but obviously the ships themselves are, you know, you know, pres is, is one of, you know, they're, they're one of the sources. Um, so I guess it's a little bit more of conversation, but, you know, is it ever the case that the MPAs, um, that part of an MPA beyond um, non-take areas for fishing, but if in terms of uh, pollution, having some kind of change with the shipping lanes, I, anyway, just something to, has, is anyone addressing that issue with regard to? Um, as far as I know, MPAs are mainly for, uh, in terms of fishing, I don't, well, I, I haven't checked it, and it's a, it's a good question, but I don't know if, if shipping lanes were altered due to the declaration of an MPA. I don't know if there's a case for that. Uh, hopefully, that would be a good takdim, uh, uh, right? <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, I just I just looked. I know I know that some conversation about this has happened because of whales in certain areas. That you know collisions with whales and and damage to habitats you know from the surface. But I think it's something that's kind of under. Well, maybe it's not understudied, but um, it, yeah, it, I've I've really heard it discussed in terms of MPA um, purpose of MPAs. Yeah, I, I wonder if if uh, if the shipping if there's like uh, importance that the shipping lanes will be in the territorial in the territorial territorial waters of Israel. That I'm not sure because now they are, if I'm not mistaken. And I know if maybe in terms of security, there is a, you know it's better that the shipping lanes will go through our territory because beyond that. Right, so if it, I can I can share the screen again, and then we can we can look at that uh, because beyond that, you know, maybe there is a safety issue, and 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 the the, the new uh, large MPAs go all the way to the to the uh, extent of of the territorial waters. So I don't know if there's uh, flexibility in, in that sense, but but we we can see it here. Oops. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are shipping lanes. It's it's not a very updated map, but I think this is kind of correct. So yeah, the shipping lanes. You know, they're they're inside the territorial waters. So I think that's probably you know it, they had to do it like that. But uh, yeah, it's it's a problem. It's a problem. I'd say I'd say that the the chicken the, is the holy cow. Nobody dares touch it. It's uh, so seriously rich and and, and influential. But uh, even when you talk to environmental uh, environmental groups, they don't really they they're like uh, pulling their heads uh, their heads up. And you know we've we've been and th that's one thing. The other the other thing is. You know, you're looking at the territorial water, but really nowadays we should think about the EEZ. You should expand your maps to the EEZ and look at the EEZ because uh, there is a big impact and a big uh, uh, significance to that area. Yeah, and, yeah, sorry, continue. <laughs> No, yeah, the, the shipping lanes, I think the shipping lanes were just established. Nobody really does touch. Yeah, so, so I'm now uh, trying to, to help the, um, uh, the blue half, the Chatsia Kachol, to look at the connectivity in the, in the EEZ, in the, the, the deep uh, habitats, and to see how the different uh, populations are connected with the deep sea animals. Uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll have some information about that soon. Okay. Uh, there is a question from the chat. Martha is curious of the lifespan of the effect of the dispersants on venting communities. So that's that's a good question. Um, there's a there was 
um, several studies following the deep water horizon on, first of all, on the effect of dispersant alone and then dispersant and oil on all sorts of, uh, all sorts of organisms. And, and uh, if I remember correctly, what they found is a synergistic um, negative effect such that when you have a mixture of oil and dispersant, it's a, it's a stronger, like a, more, a higher impact or more lethal than uh, oil alone or than dispersant alone. I think if, I'm re if I remember correctly, that was at least for, for some of the organisms. And in terms of the um, span, so it, it lasts for quite a long uh, time. And I know that because I did an analysis on, on dispersant, uh, bio, uh, dispersant markers, a spatial analysis. And what I found is that it reached more or less the same spatial extent as the oil spill. So it means that it's not disappearing um, and it, it stays, but that's, that's in the water column. Um, I'm not sure what, what's the situation after it, it sinks, but my guess is that for, for a, 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 at least for, for, for a, a chemicals that uh, are sedimented, so they last for much longer time. So if you, if you dig uh, the sediment in the Gulf of Mexico, if you dig deep enough, you will find the uh, signal of the X talk that happened in 1979. So in the sediment, the chemicals are, you know, they last for longer, they are better preserved. And so my guess is that also the dispersant chemicals last for a longer time. I think the data is there. So if you're very interested, we, we, you know, we can analyze the data and we can have an answer because there, there was monitoring for several years after the spill. And so it's, it's possible to answer this question. Thank you. Um, okay. Orly, do you want to comment on the chat or? She's here, yes. The, excuse me? Um, yeah. No, I just wrote about the marine protected area that most of them are not even recognized. Um, they're only proposed ones. So maybe, yeah, and yeah. the map is from 2012. So maybe that's the um, reason. Yeah, so, some of them are, uh, have, have been declared. I think Evtach have been declared. Uh, um, uh, the one in Achziv have, have been declared. And Rosh Karmel is almost. Yeah, so okay. it's different stages of, of uh, yeah. process, but it seems that, you know, hopefully it, it will be declared and uh, it should be. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions, so I think we should close the session for today, since we are already uh, over, over the time a little bit. So again, Eagle, thank you very much, a lot. Um, and I hope that you would like to stay in touch with us for the next uh, seminar series. Yes. Okay, sure. so I will keep you. I I will keep you in the loop. And right, uh, so well, everybody, see you. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.